Hey, sorry about that. I didn't see you there. I'm just thinking about, you know, how much I love men. Do you ever think about that? Just like how nice men are? No, just me. Well, today I'm here to talk to you about a topic that's very near and dear to my heart and uh, some other body parts as well. That is the topic of Bara, a subgenre of erotic manga um, focusing on gay men. As the topic itself already insinuates, um, this is not going to be appropriate for young audiences. Um, while I'm not going to show anything sexually explicit on screen, I will be talking about sexual material, and uh, most of the primary sources that I'll refer to will be porn. So just keep that in mind. Uh, with that having been said, I'm really excited to get into this topic. Um, I've been interested in Bara for a very long time, actually long since before I was 18. Um, and yeah, it's just a, a really, a really cool topic. And I'm really excited to have this opportunity to, to just like give a tribute to one of the most incredible gay icons that is still living with us today, Gengoro Tagame. Um, also, I should say in advance, I'm not a Japanese speaker. Um, while I have been a weeb for a very long time and I try my best with the pronunciations, I apologize in advance for what I'm sure will be a number of wrong pronunciations. Speaking of embarrassing myself while talking about a living icon, um, I thought it would be fun for this video to switch to a draw with me format. So I will be creating some bar inspired art while I talk to you all about this topic. Um, I hope you enjoy. All right, folks, um, let's get into this drawing here. Um, so as you can see, I'm just using um, some acrylic based ink and a brush. Um, just watered down with a little bit of rubbing alcohol um, to do the inking for this illustration of my character Skadi from my, my comic Lunar Phase um, and a new character who I'm kind of obsessed with drawing. Um, he doesn't have a name yet. I'm happily taking nominations in the comments below. Um, in talking about Bara as a trans man, I feel like I always have to address sort of head on the whole uh, Fujoshi thing. Um, so for those of you who don't know, the term Fujoshi in Japanese can be translated as Rotten Woman or um, An Ishii, uh, Genguro Tagame's uh, translator and English language publicist translates it as uh, Femme Misfits, which I personally like. Um, but essentially, this is the trope of uh, women who are interested in gay porn in general, particularly within Japanese culture, um, and particularly referring to um, the, the boys love or yaoi um, genre, which I will talk a bit more about later um, in comparison to Bara. Uh, but one of the one of the pervasive transphobic stereotypes about trans men is that trans men, particularly gay trans men like myself, are themselves uh, fujoshi, which is you know just like women obsessed with gay men. Um, and so this is definitely something that like I've always struggled with throughout my life uh, as someone who you know is a gay dude with a sexuality and therefore is interested in. Uh, you know, media made by other gay men depicting their sexuality. Um, and I guess one of the things that I would say is that, you know, first of all, the, the term Fujoshi um, is is consistently used as, as, as an insult, a pejorative toward women. Um, women who are usually characterized as straight, though, like, I don't know, in my experience of like gay fandom in general, most of the women who are in that space are not straight. And in fact, a significant number of them are not even women. Um, and many of them in fact are non-binary people or trans men. But I, I think also like one of the reasons I initially felt the need to distance myself from that label was because, you know, like, just to say it, like misogyny is a thing, you know, like we we think that the things that women like are not cool and we especially think that when women get excited about something that it, that's inherently a show of their, their frivolity or lack of intelligence. Um, and as I've become an adult, I've realized that like 
I don't really need to distance myself from that as much as I originally thought, especially as I become secure in my masculinity and understand that like, you know, despite all the transpho transphobes out there, like I am a man and no one can tell me otherwise. So um, recently on, on some equally, uh, you know, 2010s fandom shit, um, I received an invite to Pillow Fort, um, the, the new decentralized Tumblr, um, and someone on there was posting that actually Fujoshi has masculine and gender neutral terms now as well. So you could say that like if a, if a quote unquote rotten woman or like a, a, a woman who's interested in, in sexuality and particularly gay men's sexuality, sexuality is a Fujoshi, um, then a gay man who's into that same stuff, it would be a Fudanshi or you could say Fujin, which I think, believe is gender neutral. And again, I'll, I apologize for the Japanese uh, pronunciations. Um, okay, so what is bara? Um, according to the scholar Thomas Baudinet, um, bara or rose refers to a genre of manga that depicts... I'm sorry, I just, I can't think of the word rose in this context without thinking of... Um, well, you can imagine. Anyway, um, Obara is manga or Japanese comics depicting um, homosexuality um, produced by and for Japanese gay men. Um, its creators are often prolific producers of erotic portraiture, illustration, and even photography. Um, the term bara became widely circulated in the gay press of the 1960s as a result of Bara K, the ordeal by roses, an anthology of semi-nude homoerotic photographs taken by Aiko Hosoe of the author Mishima Yukio. This usage was further reinforced by the publication of Barazoku, the Rose Tribe, Japan's first mainstream gay magazine in the early 1970s. Um, as I alluded to at the beginning, it's practically impossible to talk about Bara without also talking about uh, Tagame Gengoro, um, or Gengoro Tagame um, in the English uh, name ordering. Um, he's a manga artist born in 1964, um, who is basically the, I don't believe that he's the originator of the Bara genre, um, but he is one of its earliest contributors and one of its widely most popular contributors. Um, and he has popularized the genre um, and created a number of very popular comics, including The Toyed Man, um, The House of Brutes, um, uh, Do You Remember the South Island's POW Camp and Pride, as well as recently the All Ages Slice of Life comic, My Brother's Husband, which has given him mainstream popularity. Tagame Sensei describes his art style as Kumake, aka Bear Type, a term that he uses to describe the masculine, muscular, and hairy men that he draws. Um, sex is typically the focus of most of his comics other than My Brother's Husband, um, and his works are primarily um, depicting uh, BDSM or um, dominant and submissive situations, um, and he magnifies these themes through science fiction, fantasy, and historical fiction. In particularly, um, he parodies or critiques um, the military and traditional Japanese patriarchy. So Bara is a gay cultural representation that specifically focuses on representations of very, um, you could say conventionally masculine men would be a way to put it, I guess. Um, they often are, are you know, almost like hyper-masculine, like very beefy men, um, often like hairy. Um, bara sex often depicts, um, you know, very, very hardcore sex, often like BDSM and things of this nature. Um, I think this has to do a great deal with Gengoro Tagame himself as one of the pioneers of the genre because he himself was into these these topics and depicted them often. Um, but in particular, um, you know, Bara is a reaction to the sort of like feminized idea of gay men that was present in Japanese society and to a certain extent still exists um, in certain stereotypes, such as, you know, the representation of the okama, 
in Japanese culture, which I don't know a lot about and honestly sometimes seems like a, a transphobic representation. So I would be really interested if people have anything to say about that. But um, nonetheless, what Bara was in, in some ways was a way to depict more realistic gay sexuality. Um, so as I mentioned before, there is actually quite a large uh, media consumer base or fandom, you could say, in Japan for media representing gay men. However, this media primarily is um, by and for women. Um, and, and particularly within the genre of manga known as yaoi or boys love, um, which is a subgenre of the, the shoujo genre, which is specifically directed at young girls. Um, and so these comics often depict gay male relationships but in a very heteronormative way you could say so often um yaoi couples for example have a very strictly defined top and bottom role um, that just doesn't have to do with you know their sexual behavior but actually has to do with their their gender presentation um, so in in some particularly infamous examples of of yaoi um, it's really exaggerated that the, the, the seme or top would be, you know, uh, often an older guy, um, much taller, presumably, you know, like stronger, though uh, often, you know, yaoi doesn't really represent the men as muscular at all. Um, they're all sort of like very um, androgynous or feminized. Um, and particularly the uke or bottom would often be a much younger man, um, sometimes concerningly <laughs> so. Um, and, um, you know, would, would depict them as, as very effeminate and, and submissive um, in a way that in my experience and in the experience of most gay men that I've met is not really realistic to how gay relationships really take place. Um, you know, even when Bara authors such as Tagame Sensei um, depict, you know, dominant and submissive relationships, which he does extensively, um, it, it has to do specifically with sex and is not conflated with gender. In fact, in one of Tagame Sensei's like original, um, very well-known comics known as The House of Brutes, um, I don't I don't know the Japanese title, I'm sorry, um, he actually represents, you know, in, in what's otherwise a gay comic, um, a couple of instances of the main character being topped by women. And it's not that he's feminized in those situations, but just to show, you know, the, the range of masculine um, sexual expression that is not necessarily different than being a man. Uh, which is often conflated quite a bit in, in straight understandings of gay sexuality, such as those that are shown in, in Yaoi or Boys Love. Um, though again, I would, I would encourage folks to wonder whether the, the women who participate in this media, who, you know, deliberately spend a lot of time and energy representing a gay relationship that is an alternative to heterosexuality, like, are these women really straight? Most of them tend not to be. One thing that I think is really interesting too um, about the, the types of sort of like heteronormative or strongly power imbalanced relationships that Yaoi represents is that um, it kind of relates back to an older Japanese tradition called Danshuku Shunga, uh, which is uh, erotic artwork depicting um, relationships between older men and younger boys that would be shown in Buddhist monasteries, um, which I think there's a really interesting analog to in Greek art, because again, there is a lot of these representations of like a sexual relationship as a form of education or tutelage um, between an older man and a younger man, but um, Tagami Sensei um, rejects the idea that Dan Shokushunga is is part of the genre of bara, and that in fact bara is kind of a reaction to this, showing you know like that it's not these older culturally defined and kind of like still somewhat heteronormative notions of sexuality. Instead, it's kind of the personal, innate, and what he terms legitimate sexuality of the modern homoerotic bara. This again takes us into thinking about how bara is is created by and for Japanese gay men. Um, so there there's a great deal of self-publishing in this industry, and as the industry has matured, there's been some really cool 
um, slice of life and semi-autobiographical comics that have started to evolve out of it um, that I think depict a, a, an even more authentic form of Japanese gay sexuality, uh, such as, for example, Tagame Sensei's um, My Brother's Husband, the only comic that I have mentioned and will mention in this video that you can check out if you are under 18, which is very lovely and cute and depicts essentially, um, oh, it's such a cute and weird story. <laughs> The premise is essentially that um, this Japanese single dad um, is is has has this white guy show up at his door, um, and it turns out this guy who is like this kind of like big bear is his the the main character's twin brother's husband, and the twin brother has since died, um, and it kind of represents the journey of this family coming together and how the main character reconciles with his brother-in-law and comes to understand like his his past brother's sexuality and and what that means and one of the things that's interesting about it is that the main character himself has to go through this struggle to understand that like oh my brother was not a woman and neither is this like obviously very large and beefy man and yet like that's what i thought being gay is which I think that a lot of us Westerners don't think about that so overtly anymore, but it definitely is part of the sort of um, the the consciousness of homophobia that people may not really be aware of. And I think that's a great segue to talk about um, how Bara is different from gay tropes in Western culture. Um, so Western culture as as we kind of know, there's a few uh, gay tropes, so we can talk about like the twink. Um, it's kind of interesting, I guess, that like I'm super interested in the bar genre because I'm definitely more of like a twinky type, though, you know, I don't actually fit any of the letters of that acronym. And again, on the subject of concerning uh, Practices with regard to age, we definitely should consider how that uh, that T sounds in there. Um, but <laughs> anyway, um, so if you think about like uh, gay gay tropes in Western culture, there's sort of the valorization of like the twink, like the skinny younger guy, which is like. Uh, a notion of, you know, like a beauty ideal that's very classical. And then, you know, in the in the 1970s and early 80s, there was the gay, the gay archetype of the clone or the Castro clone. So this would be like a hyper fit, like masculine man um, that was sort of a reaction again to the perception that gay men were feminine and often was very like, clearly a reaction to trans feminine people in particular. Um, there is a scene in the show Pose which represents this really um, beautifully where um, two of the characters go to a gay bar and they're both trans women and essentially they are kicked out of the gay bar for being trans women because the, the masculine identity of this gay bar is challenged by the presence of assigned male at birth people who present themselves in a feminine way because so much of the the gay community in the in the early like the period basically between Stonewall and the AIDS epidemic, um, it was was about reacting to this idea that like gay men were quote unquote sissies and all of this sort of thing, um, and so people felt this strong pressure to be hyper masculine. But then, um, you know, when when the AIDS crisis hit, there became this whole other dimension of it because you know as as um, as Martin P. Levine argues, um, an individual who himself ended up dying of AIDS, you know, like um, it means a whole different thing to be in physical shape and to be buff and to have a full figure when um, the community is being ravaged by a disease that leads to people, you know, losing weight, losing physical ability and just kind of fading from the inside out. Um, and so in the 80s and into the 90s, this archetype of this sort of like clone became a way of showing that you, you know, were still healthy 
Um, and and I think, you know, um, some people say that this archetype has, has fallen to the wayside. I personally would disagree. I think that the whole, like, mask for mask subculture in, in gay communities of this, like, you know, like, hyper-masculine, aggressive um, form of gay sexuality definitely exists. Um, but I think it's distinctive from Bara in some interesting ways. And one of the ways is that um, I often find that, you know, mask for mask culture is very bottom shaming, which is to say that, like, there's, um, there's some kind of, like, intrinsic shame or unacceptability or feminization even within that culture to, you know, be the person who, like, bottoms during sex. Um, and I think that that's not really present in the same way in Bara culture. I think that Bara culture uh, actually shows that despite the like visibly masculine archetypes of the characters, you know, they're all like beefy and hairy and shit. Uh, they, there's not necessarily, particularly in contemporary Bara, like the, some of the more recent work um, there's not such an emphasis on, you know, being, being as, um, as, as hyper-masculine in terms of personality. Um, one of the studies that I was reading was really interesting, was describing how um, in Japan, in Japanese, there are first-person pronouns um, that are different based on, on the gender presentation of individuals and... Um, the, the author was was showing that particularly in slice of life bara, but even in bara that depict like erotic situations, often the characters would use um, pronouns to refer to themselves that were gender neutral or less masculine, rather than the kind of hyper masculine forms um, that that would be depicted by you know like straight men in for example like action manga. Um, which I think is really interesting because I think that what Bara really reminds me of, and in fact, like uh, naively as a youth, I thought they they were named the same, is is the bear subculture um, within gay subculture. So for those who are not in the know, um, <clears throat> the bear subculture is essentially a subculture of predominantly older and um, larger in terms of body size gay men. Um, and, and, and bi men. I've been saying gay men this whole time, but obviously this is a culture that um, all, all queer men participate in, and uh, I think that's important to mention, and I apologize for my implicit biphobia. Um, but the bear subculture was, was sort of like a reaction to, on the one hand, this like clone or mask for mask subculture that was really about having like the perfect gym body. And then on the other hand, this like twink subculture that was all about being like young and waif like um, to show, you know, like essentially the dad bod, you know, like that, you know, people could have, uh, could have a little weight on them or maybe a lot of weight on them and could have body hair and that these people could be, you know, um, considered desirable um, and beautiful, in fact. And one of the other things about this um, in the scholarship d discusses how, like, fat phobia is sort of feminizing. Like, we think of men who, who are fat as, like, um, less physically capable, and we think of them as sort of, like, lazy or like inadequate providers because of the fact that they you know like don't um you know have the body type that we think is appropriate and uh, you know i think this is obviously wrong but one of the interesting things is of course when you have like this feminized discourse and the whole feminized discourse of being perceived as gay um i think that what's really lovely about the bar the bear community for the most part is that these folks actually embrace like the softness and the cuddliness and the gentleness um, that is, is, you know, the most beautiful and lovely thing about gay life that like, uh, you know, you can have on the one hand, like this eroticism, but on the other hand, like genuine affection and love, which is something that, you know, the hyper-masculine gay subcultures of previous decades really didn't, um, didn't highlight. It's right, like, it's not like, I think that we have such a, such from an outside perspective, especially of historic gay cultures, or if you're not a gay man, like, 
um, this idea that like ga gay men are hypersexualized because those are the representations, but you know, like the love and affection has always been there. But what I think is really beautiful about Vara and particularly about, um, you know, and, and also the bear subculture is just a, how the actually show the, the softness as well as, you know, the strength, the hardness, the masculinity, and how those things are, are just complementary. Like, they're not actually things that would be mutually exclusive and contradictory. Um, and I think what this kind of leads us into as well is, like, the body positivity movement. Um, it's kind of weird to think of Bara as body positivity because, in some ways, it depicts, oftentimes, again, particularly the erotic works, like very unrealistic masculine body types, you know, like you can see like dudes who are very, very large, dudes who are very unrealistically hairy, dudes with like unrealistic penis size. Um, but when you contrast it against like, particularly in Japanese society, like this very like skinny um, archetype of the gay man or like a moderately muscular archetype of the gay man like to show and appreciate this dad bod is is genuinely kind of revolutionary and i think that many of the contemporary artists who are inspired by bara really take this in you know just like an amazing direction um i'm thinking of artists like hien fam who is a uh, a a sexual a sex positive um, artist who talks about his own journeys with fat phobia and how like gay eroticism actually like helped him uh, navigate through that. I'll try and show some of his work on screen now. Um, I'm also thinking of transmasculine artists who are working in the bara genre such as Nero O'Reilly or Otava Hecula who you know for whom the whole idea of bara and trans masculinity are actually not mutually exclusive and you know i think this is beautiful and i really agree right because like um the whole trans masculine journey of you know like having a weird kind of lumpy body con uh, compared to other guys and like trying to integrate into gym culture but feeling like awkward and hypersexualized. Um, I think it just it comes across in a really cool way and it's a very cool overlap because I think Bara is already about accepting you know subversive gay bodies and subversive gay sexuality and um, you know I, I think that these trans mask artists really understand that in a cool way and you know like for me personally like Bara was the first medium in which I saw depictions of men with prominent chests and that these could also be like sexualized parts of their body but not in feminine ways which for me as a trans man was super liberatory um, and I just think that this work in general because of the body positivity aspect of it and the, the just sort of expansiveness in terms of like what bodies can be considered beautiful, what bodies can give and receive pleasure, um, and and still operate within the space of masculinity, I think is really interesting um, because, you know, I, I, think, I think we think that a lot of these conversations happen in like feminine spaces or general queer spaces, but Bara is, and, and, and you know, the bear subculture as well as kind of like an analog, um, are, are an attempt to say like, you know, we're men, we're participating in this masculine subculture and we're embracing the things about us that other people perceive as feminine, which I think is really beautiful. different outfit, different day, conclusion. Um, I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope you learned something about uh, the gay subculture of Vara and maybe just gay life in general. Um, I hope if you are over the age of 18, you check out some of the artists that I mentioned in this video. Um, and if you check out my Kofi, I'll be posting a high quality scan 
of this artwork and if you donate who knows maybe sometime in the next week or two a couple of artworks might appear uh, depicting the same two characters as the artwork I showed in this video um, but in different situations um, I hope you have a nice morning day night evening wherever you are um, and remember be gay do comics <laughs>